Hello. <laughs> if you haven't met me before, I'm Rachel. So our first reading can be found on the service sheets, and that's Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 26. So Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 26. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure, enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is this? I search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forests of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had ever been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, to the delight of the children of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward from all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do um, who comes after the king? Only what has been already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes to his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceived that the same events happened to all them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will also happen to me, also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For the wise of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all have been long forgotten. How does the wise die just like the fool? So I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after the wind. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows better he will be wise or fool? Yet he will be master of all, for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labours under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What is a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all the, his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God, apart from him who can eat or who can have enjoyment. For to the one who pleases him, God um, has given wisdom and enjoyment and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. So our second reading is Luke chapter 5, verses uh, 27 to 32, which can be found on page 776 of the Church Bibles. So that's Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32, on page 776. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, 
And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, this, It is not, help, not the healthy who need the doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks so much, Rachel. And welcome once again. If, um, if you've slipped in since we began, my name's Johnny. I'm the Assistant Minister here, and it's really, really great to have you with us at Christchurch Ballam this morning. Special, special welcome if it's your first time. It's really, really good to see a few new faces. Um, we're going to continue our journey through Ecclesiastes. So um, do open up your service sheet again to that middle page. And it's printed out there. There's space for a few notes if you want to scribble, doodle, annotate, um, whatever takes your fancy. Uh, we started last week our journey through this strange and um, arresting and very unusual book. And we're going to continue today. So let's pray for the Lord to help us as we do that. Our Father, thank you for gathering us. And thank you for speaking to us in the scriptures Please help us to know you better and enjoy you more because of our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, ITV2 are looking for vibrant singles from across the UK who are searching for love. Our islanders spend time in a luxury villa in hope of finding love. But to remain in paradise, they must win the hearts of the public and their fellow islanders who ultimately decide their fate on Love Island. If you think you've got what it takes, we want to hear from you. Well, that's the website of Love Island, and uh, their applications close on Friday, I'm afraid. Uh, I decided not to pursue it. And uh, on paper, Love Island should, of course, be paradise, shouldn't it? I mean, the most beautiful island, uh, the most beautiful people, uh, all that you could ever want in this luxury villa. Paradise, surely. And yet, I gather, having not seen it myself, uh, that it doesn't exactly turn out to be paradise. Um, Tragically, the the show has been receiving mounting criticism over the last few years. Uh, Since in 2018, the host, Caroline Flack, became the third suicide associated with the show. Paradise? Well, if it's not Love Island, uh, we look to many other places, don't we, for paradise or for pleasure or for happiness? Where is it that you look, I wonder? A prosperity, a property, entertainment, sex, education, career. Where are you trying to find paradise? Well, as Rachel just read Ecclesiastes chapter 2, I wonder if it resonated with you. Have you realized yet that you can't find it? Uh, Tragically, many people have realized that, and the statistics, particularly amongst young people, for the increase in mental disorders and bad mental health is skyrocketing. Uh, Amongst fives to fifteens, the rate of emotional disorders has gone up 48% from 2004 to 2017. A quarter of teenage girls have registered emotional disorders. Is it even possible to find joy? Well, our teacher in Ecclesiastes, he wants to help us, and he wants to do that by sharing his own experience with us. He looked in those exact same areas, prosperity, property, entertainment, sex, education, career. He explored them, and we're going to join him on his journey. So Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1, he shares that we cannot create happiness. I said in my heart, come now, I'll test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. Do you remember last week that word vanity? It it runs throughout the whole book. It's kind of the headline, the the summary words. And it's a strange word, but I said that it could most helpfully be thought of as vapor or mist. Uh, This pursuit of happiness and pleasure 
It's vapor. It just slips through your fingers. It's like trying to chase the wind or pin the wind down. <laughs> you can't. It'll just escape you. And so he tells us straight away, he gives us the spoiler, you can't find it in all these things. He despairs. He despaired over wisdom at the end of chapter one, if you remember that. It just led to more sorrow. And so he tries to cut out the middle man. If wisdom doesn't lead to pleasure, well, forget wisdom. I'm just going to try and go straight to pleasure. I'm going to just try and indulge in the most extravagant life possible and look for pleasure. He gives up academia and moves to the high life. And he does well, doesn't he? This is an extraordinary, extravagant account. At verse 2, he tries comedy, but it's mad, as most comedians will tell you. Thoroughly depressed, many of them. He tries drink, verse 3. Search with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. And yet he was just as empty as the bottle at the end of it. He tries property, verse 4, makes great works, houses, vineyards. He tries leisure, verse 5, gardens and parks. He he tries engineering, irrigates the whole thing. He he develops a massive staff, all these servants waiting on him, uh, livestock, farms. Uh, He tries, verse 8, money, treasure, entertainment, sex. He tries it all. And it's successful in some ways, verse 9. I became great and surpassed all who were before me. It's a staggering, dazzling display of of success and greatness. And yet the bottom line is devastating. Verse 11. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after winds, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. That question he began chapter one with, what do we gain from it all? What's the profit? What's the bottom line? What's the return going to be on all of this? Nothing. No gain. It's devastating. And I wonder if, as Rachel read chapter two, I wonder if it was ringing any alarm bells. If you've read the start of the Bible, those opening pages, uh, this section is full of references and allusions and and the use of words from those opening pages of the Bible. Do you remember the Garden of Eden, the original paradise that God created? So many words, uh, the planted things, the gardens, the fruit trees, the male and female, the animals, the gold. He's trying to recreate Eden. And isn't that what we try to do as we pursue pleasure and paradise? We're trying to recreate paradise. And yet the tragedy of the different conclusion. Genesis 1, God stepped back and saw all that he had made and it was very good. Ecclesiastes 2, 11. I considered all that my hands had done and all the toil I'd expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity. It's just vapor. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can't reverse the curse. Uh, Rockefeller in his day was uh, known as the wealthiest man in the world. And he famously was asked, uh, how much money do you need to be happy? Just one more dollar. We never have it. Or if, um, like me, you grew up on the films of Jim Carrey, the actor. um, He said this, I think very candid words. I wish everyone could get rich and famous and everything they've ever dreamed of so they can see that's not the answer. So if that's not all going to build paradise, create pleasure, then he he turns his mind to wisdom again. He tried exploring this last week. Verse 12, he goes back to it. Look with me at verse 12. So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there's more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there's more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. So it is, it is better to have wisdom than folly. If you can choose, yeah, pursue wisdom. It's better than not having it. But there's a, a brutal sting in the tail at the end of verse 14. And yet, I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. End of verse 16. How the wise dies, just like the fool. Even the wisest will die. What was the point of it all? 
And likewise, the next paragraph, even the hardest working will die. Verse 18, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom (laughs) under the sun. This also is vanity. Even the hardest working has got to leave it all behind. He despairs of all his efforts. What's the point in it all? Burning the candle at both ends. It won't bring joy. The next promotion you hope for. It won't bring joy. The dream job in five or ten years' time. It won't bring joy. Leo Tolstoy is one of the greatest authors. And, uh, and he wrote a very moving, revealing book, Confession, where he reached a bit of a crisis in his life. He had achieved so much uh, fame, success, um, accolades from the, the literary world. And he said this, My question, that which at the age of 50 brought me to the verge of suicide, was the simplest of questions. A question without an answer to which one cannot live, as I had found by experience. It was, what will come of what I'm doing today? Or shall do tomorrow? What will come of my whole life? Is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? Death seems to just pull the rug out from under our feet and render everything pointless and vanity and vapor. Since the moment we're born, we're dying. It's like when you cross the road here at the crossroads and as soon as you step out into the road, the countdown begins, doesn't it? The clock is ticking on our lives. And so all kinds of industries, they they try to to delay it. Like a cosmetics world is full of anti-aging products, isn't it? I don't know which ones you use. (laughs) The the nutritionists. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I found this book by this guy, How Not to Die. Have we got that? How Not to Die. I mean, good luck with that. I mean, all credit to him. You know, he, he knows his stuff. He explored all these diseases, the top 15 killers in the States, and realized that many of them are to do with our diet. And so he wrote this book about eating plant-based foods. How not to die? <laughs> What's the point of it all? What's the point? John Maynard Keynes, the economist, said, in the long run, we're all dead. And so this aim of, of recreating Eden is not going to work. Uh, paradise, trying to find that tree of life which we'll eat from and live forever. It's not going to work. We're not going to find it. We cannot solve the problem of death. And even, let's be honest, even our Christian endeavors, if you're here as a, as a Christian and you, know, you, you pursue the Lord, you work hard for him and in the church, and it's still affected by the curse. We don't get elevated above the, the vaporiness, the frustrations of this crooked, fallen world. Don't think that if you can just become like the most super studious Christian and, and know all your stuff and become the best Bible study leader and go on all the best courses and conferences, then surely that's the path to success. It's not that predictable. It's all vapor. Sadly, many of us in the church in recent months and years have become very, very aware of even what looks like the best, most admirable churches, institutions, ministers, completely fallen, crooked, the scandals, the abuse, the suffering, they continue. We're in a cursed world. And so we can easily conclude, well, why bother? Why bother? The writer seems to conclude that. Verse 17, he hated life. Verse 18, he hated all his toil. Verse 20, he's despairing. Look at verse 23 with me. For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. He can't sleep. He can't rest. We cannot create happiness. But we can receive happiness. That's the conclusion to this chapter. 
verses 24 to 26. Look at verse 24 with me. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. What? Hang on a minute. Didn't he just say a minute ago that uh, there's no happiness, no joy in toil, it's all vapor? Uh, It's a bit of a puzzle. And so some people conclude, well, maybe he's just saying, you may as well eat and drink for tomorrow we die. (laughs) It can sound like that, but no. Look more carefully. End of verse 24. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. It's not eat and drink for tomorrow we die. It's eat and drink for this we receive. They're gifts. Gifts from our sovereign creator God. Life itself is a gift from God. The overflow of his goodness and kindness. So we thank God for what we receive and enjoy it to his praise and glory. It's actually what Jesus did when he came. Do you remember that reading from Luke 5? As soon as he called Levi to follow him, what did they do? They sat down and had a meal together. That's why one scholar said that Jesus ate his way through the Gospels. He's always sitting with people and and eating and drinking with them, spending time with them, enjoying God's gifts together. Think of that this week when you, you sit and share food with someone or have a drink with someone. Jesus himself did that and dignified that act of sharing and enjoying God's gifts. We may not be able to afford the the flashiest dinner party on May 17th when you can invite six people indoors. What are you going to serve up that evening? We may not be able to afford flashy, impressive things, but just sharing the simple acts of sitting together, enjoying, sharing food and drink. These are gifts from God. Life is not about what we can gain. It is about what God has given. It really sums up the book in many ways. Life is not gain, but gift. And so as we reflect on that start of the chapter, chapter 2, did you notice how, how absent God was from it all? We just have that passage up on the screen again. And then, and then look at all the eyes, the eyes, my eyes, me's. It's full of them. He's left God out of the picture. So verse 9, I became greatest. Well, well done you. But where's God in it all? The problem creating that despair was the orientation of the heart. All that hard work, it didn't work. It might all be very splendid. But as the great ancient theologian Augustine said, Works not rooted in God are splendid sins. And so the answer is verse 25. 25, apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? God is the giver. Just as James said in the New Testament, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. If we neglect the giver, we will not enjoy the gifts. But if we receive the giver, we can receive the gifts with joy. Spot the difference? It's about the orientation, the direction of our pursuits and our life. Pursuing pleasure for ourselves. It won't work. It will fail. Pursuing pleasure towards God, from God, because of God. That will succeed, and it will bring joy. Verse 26, to the one who pleases him, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. So do you see, the way to joy is actually to stop pursuing it. To stop pursuing joy and to pursue God, the giver. And then we find joy. that verse that we read when we were confessing our sins, Jeremiah 2. It is a a vivid, arresting picture, isn't it, of the the broken, cracked wells or cisterns 
uh, looking for joy and pleasure in things that, that will not produce it because we've for- forsaken God, the source of living water. So let me ask you this morning, has your heart found the rest of coming to God and finding your joy and pleasure in him? The teacher of Ecclesiastes, he found no rest in all his toil, all that he was striving for. And as Augustine again famously said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. So coming to him, finding that rest, it it doesn't mean we we transcend and somehow escape the, the mist, the fog, the frustration, the vapor. But it does mean that we have a rootedness, a security, and a hope. Tolstoy, again, that the only way he escapes that despair was when he returned to the Christian faith of his upbringing. And in that, he found this. An, inter, an infinite meaning to the finite existence of man, a meaning that is not destroyed by suffering, deprivation, or death. Jesus brings eternal hope. He's brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And there is just a tiny hint of that future reality beyond the grave, even in this passage. Did you notice it in verse 26? To the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he is given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. There will be this great reckoning at the end. If we pursue life without God as our creator, as the giver, well, all we've made will be taken away. But as Jesus said, the meek will inherit the earth. We will receive and enjoy this new creation in the end. And so a couple of implications. Let's explore these uh, before I close. Uh, What about the area of loss? We'll all experience loss if we haven't already. And there are no neat and tidy Marie Kondo answers, as I said last week. But the perspective of Ecclesiastes does make a real difference All the possessions that we accumulate won't achieve joy. Our partners, our children, our careers, they won't achieve joy. But they are gifts, gifts from our sovereign creator God. His to give and his to take away. All that we have might evaporate, but God will never evaporate. I think it does bring a vital perspective to loss. What about the area of sharing, all that we have? Sharing. Uh, You may remember as a tiny child, one of the first things we're often taught is it's good to share your toys. And uh, and that's not just politeness. (laughs) That's not just to avoid the awkward situations for the parents. Though it is genuinely good to share. Because all that we have is not ultimately ours. Even our lives are not really ours. They are all gifts. So who can you share food with this week? Who could you have a drink with this week? These are gifts from God to share and enjoy together. And as you do that, will you thank God for them? It doesn't have to be a formal, like, special prayer of grace, but is that the inclination of your heart, that what you're enjoying is a gift from God? Or is the inclination of your heart, well done me? How would it go down if, when you have a drink with your neighbours, like we're going to do this week, and uh, you say, oh, thank God for beer. It's from God. Might lead to an interesting conversation. These things are from God. The, the delicious uh, glass of wine, the, the delicious coffee that you've made and you've carefully chosen the beans and you, you've filtered it in the ideal way. It's a gift from God. Enjoy it. The delicious salad. Who am I kidding? The, um, <laughs> the delicious burger. <laughs> They're gifts. Gifts from God to enjoy. Thank you, Father, for these gifts. And so it's fitting today that 
when we go outside, we will share the gifts of bread and wine. Because Jesus didn't just leave us with words to share, but with a meal to share. As we enjoy those gifts, the bread and the wine, and remember his body and blood shared and poured out for us to secure our place in the new creation, to enable us to receive the gift of life, which, yes, is spiritual, but is also physical, enjoying these gifts from our Father. Life is not gain. It is gift. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are sorry for pursuing our own recreation of paradise. We acknowledge that it will not work. Please help us to believe that. Please free us from the burden of thinking we can create paradise. Please help us to see that we can't. But thank you that that doesn't mean despair, but it means that we can receive gifts from you, receive life from you, our Creator and our Father. Thank you so much. So please help us this week to enjoy your gifts of creation and above all, even now, to enjoy the bread and wine that speak of our Saviour Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.